Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, my name's Anna Lubio, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the invited speaker for this afternoon. That's Pros and Jit Bose. Um, now, Jit works in an area that's not like centrally graph drawing. He works in graph drawing, but also in computational geometry and also in data structures. And we saw some maps last day that had uh, like the central nodes of graph drawing. But what wasn't shown there is something equally important, is the connector nodes that connect graph drawing to other areas. And I think JIT would be one of those main uh, connector nodes. Um, now JIT, uh, he's at Carleton University, which is in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Uh, got his PhD in 94 with Godfrey Toussaint at McGill. And after that, he did a postdoc with uh, David Kirkpatrick at UBC in Canada. And before that, he did a master's at the University of Waterloo with me and Ian Monroe. So he has a very Canadian pedigree, which is actually kind of unusual, because Canada is actually kind of small. I mean, not the landmass, but the population. <laughs> like we're half the size of Italy and less than half the size of Germany and so on. Now, most people think of Canada as sort of, you know, maybe the US without the extremes. Um, but another stereotype would be uh, that Canadians are a little bit understated. And Jit is certainly no exception to this. Um, you know, so maybe it's the earring or the way he looks so friendly. But uh, you wouldn't guess from looking at him that he's Associate Provost of Research at Carleton. Um, he's President of Scholarships at NSERC, which is the Canadian federal funding organization. Let's see, he has like 250 papers on DVLP. He has a paper with 1,500 citations which uh, I think the only graph drawing papers that get close to that are the spring embedders, but this is a paper on routing, so online routing in, uh, in wireless uh, networks. Um, what else? Uh, uh, so besides connectors and central nodes, what's also important, and you'd only see it if you see uh, the timeline of graph drawing developing, is nodes that regenerate, that attract young people into the area. So at Carleton, he's... Uh, organizing a research group there that includes like five faculty members, more than a dozen PhDs, visitors, postdocs, and it takes great leadership skills to do that. So it's very impressive. Um, so you might not also guess from what I've said or from looking at Jit that actually he was born in Paris. He speaks four languages. He's a gourmet cook, and more impressive to me is he cooks every day for his family. Um, what else can I tell you? He's a connoisseur of music. And um, so along with this understated thing, I, I wasn't a fellow student of his, right? I was a supervisor, so I don't have any like really embarrassing stories. But I'll tell you one story about when he was a student, just to warn you that you shouldn't underestimate him. So he likes to start a conversation by saying something like, I was wondering. And he says it kind of slowly. It gives you time to think between the words. So he was a student, and he said, well, you know that geometry problem? I was wondering if maybe there were graphs involved. I said, oh, yeah, good idea. Maybe it's like foo graphs. He said, no, I was thinking it shouldn't be foo graphs. It should be foo prime graphs. I said, oh, yeah, right. So maybe we could look them up. We could do a search. He said, well, I did that already, but all I could find is an unpublished tech report. I said, well, maybe you could send email to the author of the tech report. He said, well, I did that already. <laughs> and at this point, I'm realizing, uh -huh, you know, forget this student-supervisor relationship. Here's a colleague to work with. So also, uh, along the lines of that story, do not be deceived if the title of this talk is Flips. It's not being flippant. <laughs> Welcome, Jit. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Anna. So, um, well, before I begin, let me tell you that uh, it's interesting that we're at Microsoft because um, uh, it is uh, because of Anna that I'm I'm in academia and and um, uh, uh, decided to uh, to pursue research in computational geometry because back in 1989. 
I had to decide uh, between coming to work at Microsoft or doing a master's. And so, <laughs> so here I am. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wonder, do I get the record for the shortest title? Or uh, it's unclear, five letters? So I was thinking maybe if, if that's not the record, maybe that should be the title of the. <laughs> I don't know if many people can beat uh, four letters for a title. Um, so flips or f uh, are, are a topic that, um, that are, is near and dear to my heart. And um, I've dabbled a little bit in, in the area. And I see that in the audience there's uh, several of you that have also dabbled. Um, so before I tell you about the area, um, let me first tell you what a flip is um, and um, how I'm going to define a flip. So essentially, you can think of a flip operation as the following. Um, so you delete an edge from a graph and then you reinsert a, a different edge and what you want is the graph to remain in the same graph class. Okay. So if you have a triangulation, then you want to delete an edge from the triangulation. You want to add another edge. You want it to be a triangulation uh, uh, for a tree and, and so on. So flips have been studied in, in the literature in many, many different contexts. They've been studied for trees, planar graphs, triangulations, graphs embedded in different surfaces, uh, pseudo-triangulations, convex polygons, and so I could go on and on and on. So there are many, many variants of this problem. Uh, depending on what type of graph class you uh, select. And people have looked at other sort of local change type operations as well. So not necessarily just an edge flip, but a, a, a local change that keeps the, the graph within the same graph class. Okay. Um, so, but I'm just going to focus on, um, uh, I want to focus on specifically uh, flips in triangulations. For this talk, I want to focus in on that. And I want to talk a little bit about two different settings. So combinatorial setting and uh, geometric setting. So I'll tell you in, in a moment uh, what, what those two settings are. Okay. Um, and um, the main question that's driven the research in this area is some variant of the following question, which is, you're given two triangulations, and you're asked, uh, is there a sequence of edge flips that transforms one triangulation uh, into uh, the other? Okay, the, that is sort of like the base question that uh, has driven a lot of the, the research in this area. So what I wanted to do is essentially give you a little survey of what's known in, uh, in this area, both in the geometric setting and the combinatorial setting. And more than that, what I want to do is I just don't want to state results, but I want to also give you a flavor of how some of the proofs uh, work in, in this area as well. Okay, so I just, uh, that's sort of the goal that I have for, uh, for this talk. All right. Um, so in the combinatorial setting, what we have is the graphs are triangulations. Uh, so essentially every face, including the outer face, is a triangle. And the triangulations are embedded combinatorially, which is uh, basically cyclic order of the edges around the vertices is defined. Um, and uh, so let me tell you, uh, uh, let me show you a flip operation. So the way a flip operation works in a triangulation, so here's a triangulation in the combinatorial setting. Um, so you just pick an edge and you look at the two triangles which are adjacent to that edge and you delete, uh, you delete that edge and replace it with, an, with the uh, one which is connecting the two apices of the triangle. Okay? So that's a flip operation. Now not every edge in a triangulation can be flipped. Okay? So for example, uh, if I pick that edge, uh, then I would want to join this apex to that apex and essentially that becomes illegal because uh, it's no longer simple. The graph is no longer simple. Okay? So we allow flips as long as the graph 
remains a triangulation and it's uh, simple. Okay, all right. So the first result I'm aware of in this area is a paper by Wagner. And um, in fact, it's written in German. And so I have a PhD student that speaks German who actually translated the paper for me. So that was, that was fun. Um, so essentially, uh, what, what he proved is that given two triangulations, uh, you can always um, transform one into the other using uh, essentially n squared flips. Okay, all of n squared flips. And the idea uh, is the following, which is uh, you're given any triangulation and you want to use edge flips to flip it to the one where uh, you have two nodes adjacent to everybody. Okay, two dominant nodes. Um, and that triangulation is called uh, Wagner's uh, canonical triangulation. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, and how do you do this? So in his proof, basically, um, he showed that with a linear number of flips, you can always increase the degree of one of the two ends. Okay? Um, so it's not always true that with one flip you can do it. Uh, because if we look here, um, these are the edges adjacent to A. And notice that if I flip any one of them, I'll create a parallel edge, right? So if I flip this one, then A joins to U, but there's already an edge AU, okay? So if I flip any of the edges, which would potentially increase the degree of A, I create a parallel edge, okay? Um, but he showed that uh, if that's the case, then you always have a triangle, um, which has a vertex that you're not adjacent to. And then if you flip that edge, that vertex uh, in some sense gets closer to A. Okay, so that's the idea behind. And he shows that with a sequence of at most a uh, linear number of flips, you will eventually increase A's degree. Okay, so that's, that's where we get this uh, 2n squared minus 14n plus 24, okay? So that's what was known from 1936 until the early uh, 1990s. Um, so it wasn't clear, people didn't know if, uh, if n squared flips uh, was sufficient and sometimes necessary, or was it linear, or is it n log n? We didn't know. Um, so there is an omega uh, n lower bound, um, which you can easily see by uh, looking at that canonical triangulation. And if I want to flip that one to a triangulation where every vertex has constant degree, then I'm forced to uh, make a linear number of flips. So there's an upper bound of uh, uh, quadratic and a lower bound of uh, linear. Um, so then Kumoro came along and showed that actually a linear uh, number of flips suffice. And um, so if, if I was lucky and I could always increase the degree of one of the two uh, vertices where I'm trying to go to the canonical one uh, with one flip, then it's easy to see that a linear number of flips is, is sufficient. But we saw that that's not the case, right? So here's another example uh, where no flip will increase the degree of VI or VJ. Okay, every single flip uh, that potentially can increase their degree will create a parallel uh, edge in, uh, in this example. Okay, however, um, Kumoro's idea was the following. So he defined a potential function uh, based on these two uh, special vertices. Uh, which looks like this, three times the degree of VI plus the degree of VJ. And what he was able to prove was that um, maybe I'm not able to increase the degree of one of these two with uh, one flip, 
but with two flips, I can always increase the degree of VI. Okay? And the reason he used uh, three times the degree of VI plus the degree of VJ is because sometimes to increase the degree of VI, you need to decrease the degree of VJ. And so the potential still goes up by two. So with two flips, the potential goes up by two. And so uh, you're able to bound the total number of flips uh, required. Um, so the maximum potential you can have is 4n minus 1, right? Because each of these uh, vertices, you want them to become dominant. And so that means that 8n minus 1 flips suffice to convert uh, one triangulation into the other. Because I take the first one, I make it canonical, and then I take the second one, I make it canonical, and then just run the, the, the flips backwards, okay? All right. Um, if you do a little more careful analysis, you can actually sh uh, bring it down to 8n minus 54 instead of 8n minus 8. Um, all right. And then um, about seven or eight years later, uh, Mori, Nakamoto, and Ota improved this to 6n minus 30. And their idea is the following. So the key behind um, their approach is to first convert any triangulation you give me into one that contains a Hamiltonian cycle. And the way they do that is uh, by removing all separating triangles. Okay, so if I remove all separating triangles, then um, there's a famous uh, theorem uh, by, famous theorem by, well, Tut, uh, is it Whitney? I think it's Whitney who showed that every, uh, every four connected uh, triangulation is Hamiltonian. Um, okay, uh, so let's see what happens. So let's say uh, here I have uh, one separating triangle, two separating triangles, and that's it. So if I flip those, I have no more separating triangles, and so this should have a Hamiltonian cycle, and there's the Hamiltonian cycle. Now, uh, if you look at the Hamiltonian cycle, um, essentially, a triangulation that's Hamiltonian, you can view it as two uh, triangulated outer planar graphs, okay? And there are some results on how to convert one triangulated outer planar graph into another triangulated outer planar graph. So there's a paper by uh, Slater, Targen, and Thurston that uh, shows um, a connection between uh, triangulated outer planar graphs and rotations in binary, uh, binary uh, search trees. And so uh, using their result, you can convert this uh, outer planar graph into the one you want and the other one into the one you want using two times those number of flips. Like so 4n minus, uh, 4n minus 20. But actually, you can save a bit because once you've converted this one uh, into, into uh, this situation, the other one you can save a few flips. So you can do it with um, 4n minus 22. Okay, so then their approach is you take a triangulation, you remove all of the separating triangles uh, using n minus 4 flips at most, then it's Hamiltonian, so you convert it from that to the other Hamiltonian, and then you bring it, you, you run the process backwards. And if you do the math, uh, 2 times n minus 4 plus 4n minus 22 gives you the 6n minus 30. Okay. So, um, I, uh, very recently, I came across uh, another paper by Slater, uh, Tarjan, and Thurston, uh, called Short Encodings of Evolving Structures, okay? And, uh, I mean, it doesn't have flips or triangulations or it doesn't have many of the keywords that you would expect in, the, in their uh, abstract or title, and so I only found it uh, recently, and if you read through that paper, so they're solving a completely different problem. 
but buried inside their proof is exactly this, this proof. So we knew that a linear number of flips was sufficient back in 92, or th those three knew back in 92, and, uh, and I just discovered it uh, recently. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, about their result uh, a, a little bit later, okay? But it's exactly uh, a subroutine in their, in their, uh, in their proof uh, does exactly this. Okay, so uh, with a few of my students, we were thinking how, you know, is, is 6n minus 30 the best we can do or can we, can we improve even more? And um, it seemed unlikely that we can improve the, the, the part where we're converting one Hamiltonian triangulation into another because in their paper, Slater, Tarjan, and Thurston actually proved that sometimes you need 2n minus 10 flips to convert one, tri one outer planar triangulation into another. So, um, so if we're going to take their approach and we're going to first convert a triangulation to Hamiltonian and then uh, that to the canonical, uh, the part where you go from Hamiltonian to canonical seems like there's not much room for improvement. But the part where you remove all the separating triangles, that seemed to have uh, some looseness. And in fact, that's where we focused in. And uh, we were able to show that, in fact, 3n minus 9 over 5 flips are sufficient to remove all the separating triangles. So let me give you uh, an idea. So if I wrote, so initially, this was the number of flips that we had proved. And um, our argument is, a, is an amortized uh, uh, argument. And the idea is we put coins on all of the edges of the triangulation. So that's where the 3n minus 6 comes from. And we showed that for every separating triangle where we flip an edge to remove the separating triangle, um, we can pay for it with five coins. So that's where the divided by five comes from. And then we realize that at the end of this whole process, uh, we can always guarantee that there are th still three coins left on the outer face. So that's where we could get the minus, uh, minus nine from. Okay, so let me give you a little idea of how uh, the proof goes. So let's say that um, in my triangulation I have only one separating triangle. Okay, so let's say it happens to be this one. Okay, so that means I have some stuff in here and I have stuff out here. Okay, and I have a coin on each edge. Okay. And what we're going to do is the invariant that we want to maintain is that every separating triangle has a coin on, the, on their edges. And uh, they all have an edge. So every separating triangle has an edge which is sort of going into the triangle uh, and an edge which is going out of the triangle. So, so uh, the other thing we're going to maintain is for every edge that's going in, uh, at least one of them has a coin on there. So that's the invariant we're going we're gonna to maintain. And um, so you can show that, let's say I flip this edge to remove uh, the separating triangle. Then I can take the three coins on the separating triangle because it's no longer separating. I'm never going to use them anymore. And we can pick uh, two of these coins because uh, there's no other separating triangle inside. That's the only separating triangle, okay? So essentially, um, the way our, uh, uh, we remove separating triangles is if you think a little bit about it, separating triangles, if you think about it from the point of view of containment, form a partial order, okay? And what we do is we always look at the deepest separating triangle. Okay, the one that's guaranteed to not have 
uh, any separating triangles inside. And that's what's going to allow us to remove some of these, uh, some of these coins. Okay? And then it just becomes a case analysis where you know, if, you, if the deepest separating triangle is contained in another one, well, these are the five coins we can take. And then if you have, it's contained in another one, but there's also a separating triangle here that's just as deep, well, these are the five coins you can take, and so on. So, so if you go through a, a, a lengthy case analysis, you're able to show that in every case, you can always find five coins to pay for the edge you're flipping. Okay? So um, that's what led to this improvement. So 3n minus 9 over 5. Okay, plus the two times um, two times two uh, n minus ten gives you the five point two n minus thirty three point six. Okay, all right, um, and then we were able to come up with a construction where uh, we have a triangulation that has three uh, n minus ten over five. Uh, disjoint separating triangles. Okay? And so since you have to flip at least one edge from each of those, that essentially says that the, uh, that the bound is tight. So the idea is the following. Um, so this is, um, this is the base, base case of our recursive construction. Okay? And what we do is we put, uh, we put a vertex inside each of these triangles uh, that makes them separating. All right? And if you count how many, how many separating triangles there are here, you'll get exactly 3n minus 10 over 5. And if you want to build a bigger example, then you take this one and, uh, sorry, you take this one and for each one of these, you add a copy of this inside here and then you repeat. Okay? And so you get this this family where the number of vertices is mod 5, and that's the number of flips, uh, edges you need to flip to remove all separating triangles. Okay. All right. Um, so what about lower bounds on the number of flips? Um, the best known lower bound is uh, 2n minus 15. And the 2n minus 15 comes from essentially uh, going from a triangulation where the maximum degree is 6 to the canonical triangulation. Okay? So you can show that the two vertices that have degree uh, n minus, whoops, so they have degree n minus 1, okay? And there's two of them. Uh, if, if I want to flip them until they have degree 6, then I got to flip at least this many. And then since there's an edge connecting them, uh, you get a minus 1. So that's how you get the 2n uh, minus 15 flips are sometimes necessary. Um, and that's the best that we know. And it's a little ironic that the, the triangulation that everyone's trying to go to uh, is the one that's giving the lower bound. <laughs> okay? so, seems to suggest that maybe that's not the best triangulation you want to go to, and maybe there's something better, uh, better you can do. And in general, that is the big problem in this area, that we go to a canonical triangulation. So even if two, uh, two triangulations are uh, one flip apart or two flips apart, uh, using this method, you're still going to make a linear number of flips. Okay? All right. Um, so, if we take a little step back, sometimes people think of flips in terms of a graph where every triangulation, every n vertex triangulation is a node of that graph and two nodes are adjacent um, if they're one flip apart. Okay? So then all of these questions that we were asking about flips um, become questions on this graph. So, if you want to know what's the... Uh, uh, maximum number of flips uh, to go from any one to any other, that's like asking for the diameter of that graph. If you want the minimum number of flips to go from one triangulation to another, well then you're asking for a shortest path in that graph and so on. Okay? All right, so I want to mention a couple of open problems. So first, is 4n minus 22 a type 
upper bound on the number of flips to convert any Hamiltonian triangulation to any other. Um, I think it's pretty close, but unclear. Uh, is 5n, 5.2n minus 33.6 a tight upper bound? Um, I think if you're going to use uh, this approach where you want to go to Hamiltonian and then, uh, and then apply the, the, the flips to go between two Hamiltonian triangulations, I think the place where you can save is possibly, notice that uh, when I start with a triangulation, I, I went to a Hamiltonian triangulation by becoming four connected, okay? But there are many more triangulations that are Hamiltonian than there are four connected triangulations. So maybe going to a, a triangulation that's Hamiltonian requires fewer than uh, 3n minus 9 over 5 flips. And, and that's probably uh, where I think you might be able to find some some savings. Uh, the other question uh, is, can you determine the minimum number of flips to convert one into the other? Um, so we're going to see that in the geometric setting, this problem is, uh, has been shown recently to be um, NP-hard. And so is it NP-hard in the combinatorial setting? Uh, unclear. I don't know. Um, or even, can you find something uh, which has some dependence on the length of the shortest path. You know, can you guarantee that uh, the number of flips you'll do is, is some function of the length of the shortest path? Uh, and uh, there's nothing known in the combinatorial setting. There's a few partial answers in the geometric setting, which, uh, which I'll talk to you about. All right. So this is, I think, the main problem. And I think the... the what we need is a new idea of how to go from one triangulation to another without going through some canonical triangulation. If you, if, if you want to make some progress on this, that's, that's what I think we need. All right, what about maximum number of flippable edges? So this, is, this would be like asking for what's the maximum degree in the flip graph or the minimum degree or the average degree and so on. Um, so Gao, Rutia, and Wang showed that there are always at least n minus 2 flippable edges. And the way they showed that was, again, they focused in on separating triangles uh, and used the fact that every edge of a separating triangle is flippable. Okay? And you can sort of see why. Um, so if you take an edge of the separating triangle, when I flip, because it's a separating triangle, there's no edge that exists between something that's outside uh, and something that's inside, okay? Um, so their, uh, their upper bound, the argument sort of goes like this. They say, well, suppose that there's one edge that's not flippable. Well, why is it not flippable? Uh, that probably is because when I do flip that edge, I get a parallel edge, and if I get that parallel edge, Notice that that means that this is a separating triangle because I got something inside and I got stuff outside, okay? So that means that these three edges are flippable, which contradicts the fact that uh, you started with the assumption that uh, there was no edges flippable on that triangle, okay? Um, for the lower bound, basically you start with a triangulation and you stick a point inside each triangle, and if you just add it up, first you notice that the only edges which are flippable are edges of the original triangulation. Because these things that I added, if I flip them, I will create parallel edges. Okay? And if you just do the math, you get that uh, the number of original edges is n minus 2 with respect to, the, uh, to this graph. Okay. So, some questions to think about. Um, people also looked at, instead of flipping one edge at a time, what if I can select a whole subset of edges and flip them all at the same time and call that a simultaneous flip? Okay, so this notion uh, was introduced by Galtier, Hurtado, Noy, Perenes, and Urrutia, uh, but in the geometric setting. 
So in the combinatorial setting, essentially the way simultaneously, uh, simultaneous flips work is you select a subset of edges and flip them all at the same time such that you still get a triangulation, no parallel edges. Okay? So in that setting, uh, we're able to show that one simultaneous flip allows you to remove all of the Hamiltonian triangulation. Uh, all of the Hamiltonian, uh, sorry, all of the separating triangles so that your graph becomes Hamiltonian. So one flip, simultaneous flip is enough. And then you can show that log n is uh, sufficient and sometimes necessary. So let me give you a little quick idea of how that works. Um, so you convert the first triangulation into a Hamiltonian one with one simultaneous flip. And then you have these two outer planar graphs. And so with the two outer planar graphs, you can use log n flips to convert them to a, a star, essentially. Okay? And that brings you to uh, Wagner's um, canonical uh, form. All right, so this is the idea. So I find the separating triangles, I flip them, I find the Hamiltonian cycle, and uh, with log n simultaneous flips, I can go to the canonical form. Okay, what about the lower bound? So the lower bound is, again, you take a graph that has uh, one vertex that has very high degree, linear degree, and uh, now you notice that uh, simultaneously I can only flip half the edges. And so then you get, uh, you get the log n uh, from there, okay? Um, what about how many edges can you flip simultaneously? So here's how you can get this bound of 6 uh, sevenths n minus 2. So again, you start with a triangulation, and now instead of sticking a point inside each face, you stick a triangle inside each face, and you complete it like this. And now you'll notice that uh, there are seven triangles in here, and so when I simultaneously flip, there'll always be one triangle that uh, can't have any of its edges flipped, okay? Um, and so since one of the seven triangles does not have an edge in the optimal flip set, you, that's how you get the six sevenths, okay? So here are a couple of open problems in this setting. So can we close the gap? So the constants, that's why I wrote big O, the constants are huge. Um, uh, the way that uh, simultaneous flip edges are computed, they're computed <laughs> sequentially. So it would be interesting to see if we can actually compute them in parallel. Uh, and finally, the upper bound, uh, upper and lower bound between uh, the number of simultaneously flippable edges is, is pretty bad. So that would be interesting to close that gap. All right, what about the geometric setting? So in the combinatorial setting, I was given a graph, a planar graph that's not embedded. In the geometric setting, now I'm given a graph whose vertices are points and edges are straight line segments. Um, and a legal flip is one where if the edge I choose, I look at the two triangles adjacent to it, uh, they have to form a convex quadrilateral. So if they form a convex quadrilateral, then I can flip that edge, okay? If they don't form a convex quadrilateral, like in this case, then I can't flip that edge, okay? All right, so in, in here, uh, one of the first results uh, is by Lawson, who showed that uh, O of n squared flips are sufficient to convert any triangulation um, to the Delaunay triangulation, okay? And um, if you've ever taken a course in computational geometry, this is probably one of the things that uh, you will have seen in your computational geometry class. Um, okay. Um, so, here we can see one of the big differences between the combinatorial setting and the geometric setting. So in the combinatorial setting, we saw that a linear number of flips 
was sufficient to go from any one triangulation to another. In the geometric setting, uh, there are some triangulations that require a quadratic number of flips. And uh, this is something that Hurtado, Noy, and Urrutia showed. It's a really nice construction. I like it. Um, so here's, um, here's two convex chains. Uh, co co here's two, one convex, one concave chain, which, which is triangulated. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate a binary uh, string uh, with this. Uh, where if the base is on the bottom, it gets a 1, and if the base is on top, it gets a 0. Okay? And now notice that the only edges I can flip are when uh, 0 and 1 are adjacent. Okay? Because if I have two 1s adjacent, well, this is a reflex vertex, I can't flip it. And if I have two zeros adjacent, same thing, that's a reflex vertex, I can't flip it. So then, you can show that to go from this triangulation, um, to that triangulation, uh, you need a quadratic number of flips because each of these zeros has to cross over each of these ones. Okay? All right. So, if we're given an arbitrary triangulation on endpoints, one question which might be interesting is um, what about going to a class of triangulations that has some property? So, like Hamiltonian, can I do that? in fewer than a quadratic number of uh, flips. Um, or here's another one, which um, it's, it's not a completely well-formed question, but uh, let me try and uh, give you some idea of what I mean by this. Uh, if you look at uh, algorithms that compute the greedy triangulation or the Delaunay triangulation uh, of a point set, uh, most of them use um, uh, complicated data structures, let's say. For example, the Delaunay triangulation, sometimes you might have to build a point location structure uh, in order to make it run efficiently, uh, and so on. And so the simplest triangulation algorithm that I know uses just um, uh, one stack, and basically it's an algorithm called Graham scan, and if you run Graham scan twice, uh, you can triangulate a point set. Okay? Uh, now, it would be interesting if that triangulation, we could show that with a subquadratic number of flips, you can go to the Delaunay triangulation. So that would give you an alternative way to build the Delaunay triangulation without resorting to uh, uh, let's say some complicated data structures. So that's something that, that I think would be interesting to, to think about. Okay. Um, this question was, uh, some progress was made very recently, and in fact by Anna uh, and one of her students, and independently um, uh, Alexander Pills showed that uh, question number three is NP-hard. Okay. And uh, so then the question becomes, well, can you approximate? Can we find something, you know, if, if two triangulations are one flip apart, I should be able to figure that out, you know? Um, and there was a little bit of progress made in this by uh, Hank, is it Hank or Hanky? Are there any Germans in the crowd that can? Hanke. Hanke, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, can you pronounce the other two names too? <laughs> How do you pronounce this one? That is easy. <laughs> okay, what they showed was if you give me two triangulations on the same point set, then I can convert one into the other where the number of flips I use is uh, not more than the number of intersections between the overlay of those two triangulations. Okay, so if I'm one flip apart, uh, I will have only one intersection, and this algorithm will will find it. Okay, but if I'm more than one flip apart, well, uh, all bets are off. But at least it solves the one flip apart question. <laughs> but <laughs> and it's the only well one the, one of the only results that I've seen that that does not go via a canonical triangulation. 
right? So this doesn't go via canonical triangulation. So the number of flips is really dependent on the two input triangulations that, that you're given, okay? The other one that makes uh, some progress on this question is, well, maybe I should ask David to uh, talk, no, <laughs> is, uh, uh, so David showed, this was actually the first paper in the Journal of Computational Geometry, if uh, you're familiar with that journal, uh, that for restricted point sets, um, so point sets that don't contain uh, empty convex pentagons, uh, then you can find the exact minimum flip distance between, uh, between two triangulations. And the way he did that was he gave a method for computing a lower bound which happens to be exact uh, for this restricted point set. And uh, for, it's still a lower bound for arbitrary point sets, but it's not, uh, it's not tight. Is that right? No, oh, okay, all right. Um, for simultaneous flips, uh, so remember I told you Galtier, Hurtado, Noy, Perennis, and Urrutia uh, introduced this notion. So since in the geometric setting there are certain instances where I require a quadratic number of flips, it's normal to uh, assume that a linear number of simultaneous flips is uh, sometimes necessary and hopefully uh, sufficient. And so that's what they showed. Um, and uh, they also looked at how many edges uh, are guaranteed to be simultaneously flippable? So for their upper bound, they basically showed that this recurrence gives you the upper bound, where you can count the number of uh, edges that are simultaneously flippable. And uh, for the lower bound, uh, since n over 4, n minus 4 over 2, edges are individually flippable, they showed that at least a third of those can be flipped simultaneously. And uh, very recently, uh, Suvain, uh, is Chaba here? No? Ah, there, see, I can embarrass you. <laughs> so uh, Diane, Chaba, and Andrew uh, showed uh, that in fact, uh, the n minus four uh, divided by five bound is tight for simultaneously flippable edges in uh, the geometric setting. Um, so here's some open problems you can consider. So uh, can one flip simultaneously to a Hamiltonian triangulation? So in the combinatorial setting, we saw that just one flip brought us to Hamiltonian. So here, can I do it with fewer than a linear number of simultaneous flips to go to Hamiltonian. Mm. I, my guess would be yes. <laughs> um, and can you compute these edges which we can flip simultaneously in parallel? Because right now, uh, all of the papers that talk about simultaneous flips actually compute the <laughs> simultaneously flippable edges uh, sequentially. Um, and finally, the same question that uh, plagues the uh, sequential uh, also comes into play here, that there's no algorithm that is sort of sensitive to the minimum number of flips required uh, for simultaneous flips. Okay, so remember that paper that I just found recently. So let me tell you uh, a bigger part of the uh, story. Um, so essentially, uh, what they solved was they looked at flips uh, in labeled triangulations. Um, so now I want to go from one labeled triangulation to another. All right. So there, uh, for the upper bound, the idea is the following. So you take both triangulations and you think of them as unlabeled and you bring them to the canonical form. Okay. And now what happens is uh, the labels here are screwed up. And so what you need to do is a permutation. So they essentially do something like merge sort on the spine here, which is what gives the n log n. Okay? So n log n flips are sufficient 
uh, to go from any labeled triangulation to any other labeled triangulation. They also gave an n log n lower bound. And the idea for the lower bound is essentially they showed that um, with n flips, m flips, This is what they showed, where n is the number of vertices, m is the number of flips, and c is some constant. So they showed that with m flips on an n vertex uh, labeled triangulation, this is the total, an upper bound on the number of triangulations I can reach. And in the labeled setting, there are essentially n factorial uh, uh, triangulations, labeled triangulation. Well, n minus three factorial, if you want to be uh, precise. And so this has to be bigger than uh, n minus three factorial. And if you do the math, you'll see that that means that m has to be at least n log n. Okay. Um, so we see that there are. There are some discrepancies between the combinatorial setting and the geometric setting. So in the combinatorial setting, um, almost all the edges are flippable. Um, and you can go from any triangulation to any other triangulation. In the geometric setting, you're dependent on, on your point set. Right? So if I give you a point set in convex position, you can only draw um, outer planar uh, graphs. Um, and so, so then we started thinking, well, is there a way to sort of combine the two? Where if I want to go from any triangulation where I have, let's say, the same number of vertices on the outer face to any other triangulation, but they're both embedded on a point set, can I go from one to the other? Okay. And the idea there is uh, we introduce something that we call a point move. And so a point move is basically uh, a move where I can pick up a point and then drop it somewhere in the plane. And it's legal if the graph remains uh, triangulation. OK? Um, so for example, if I picked this point up and put it here, then that wouldn't work. Right, because then this edge here would cross. Okay, but here's here's a valid point move. Right, so you can go from here. I take this one and I can put it there, and that's a valid point move. Okay, and that's pretty powerful if you think a little bit about it. And so what we were able to show is that with a linear number of point moves and quadratic number of edge flips. You can convert any triangulation to any other. And then uh, we were able to show later on that with n log n flips and moves, you can convert any triangulation to any other. Um, and I think. Did you before that uh, n squared edge, edge flips are always sufficient? Pardon me? Didn't you show before that in the purely geometric setting, uh, a quadratic number of flips suffices? So yes, but this is if I if I have two different point sets, yeah. So uh, so I'm going from one, you know. So I have to take this point and move it to that point, and so on. Okay. So you give me two final triangulations on two different point sets, and I want to use that. So if you only allow me a linear number of point moves, then I need a quadratic number of flips. Uh, but if, if I can do n log n moves, then n log n flips is also sufficient. Okay, I think, I think I'll leave it at that. Other questions? You have the geometric set uh, uh, version. 
Uh, other results known about fixed parameter uh, on, on, on parameterized complexity. Not so the NP, uh, I think it's the same question to uh, yeah. Anna. Yeah. If, you, if, you have, if you have the NP hard result. You have the NP hard result. <laughs> and then, uh, I like this. Defer questions to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Are uh, you aware of that? A similar question. Suppose I were the, the flip expert, which I'm not. Uh, if I tell you the truth, well, here are two triangulations, and you can do them within k flips. The k is given to you. Right. Okay. Does it help you? I, I'm sure it does, but <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't. Uh, I can't think of a way to to exploit that. You can choose the ten all, all all sets of ten edges and try them. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, if you give me k, I can do it in into the k something. Into the k something. No, into the k. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. But yeah, exactly. I mean. If k is ten, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were talking about point moves, I thought you were going to talk about deleting points or inserting points when the deletion would, would um, create something that's still a triangle because it has only three neighbors. Yes, or the so, so for, for that, that's been studied in uh, where people have looked at uh, pseudo-triangulations. So when they want to go from one pseudo-triangulation to another, they've uh, looked at going via some deletions, but uh, but n not not in just pure triangulation setting. Okay. That, I thought it had been studied in a topological setting, which ah. we really discuss. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's an it's an example of a bi stellar flip. Okay. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering uh, if the vertices are color triangulation and then you flip can you imagine what it does to the color i'm just wondering is it completely random or does it have is there some normal to it? i'm not sure so you're giving me like i don't know you, you four colored one graph and now you want to see if you can maintain the coloring via flips or something or well no i'm just wondering what does it do just one flip right will do something to the color uh, can you always, I mean, do you have to change the whole thing or is it just... Well, one flip is, uh, I mean, one flip is going to just make two vertices adjacent that weren't adjacent before, right? So I don't think it'll have a ripple effect, just one flip. Uh, I can imagine it could, does it? Well, okay, if you want to keep the same number of colors, right? I guess, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I don't know. No. Well, the one thing I do know is some people looked at a point location where uh, they looked at something um, along the lines of, you know, if I have a triangulation that looks like this, uh, then uh, doing point location in these triangles is very easy. I can just do some binary search, right? And then uh, if it's a small number of flips to get to the actual triangle of, of your triangulation, uh, then that can serve as an alternative to, uh, to give you a point location structure. But, uh, yeah. Uh, there are flips also if you have body networks. You see, in CAD, you sometimes have networks, nets, which are not triangles, but quadrants. It, it has been studied, yes. Yeah. But I'm not very familiar with. Yeah. So in the, in, the, in the flips and moves, you're given n points, right, and the triangulation. Did I get it right? Flips and moves, you're given two <coughs> sets of points. Two sets of points. Yes. Yeah. Right, and you have two triangulations. Triangulation has n vertices. Yes. Uh, did anybody think about uh, having uh, not n points but more than, say, two n or three n points, and would that? Uh, reduce the number of flips and moves that are needed in this case. So in this case, uh, so so for. So 
you would only be yeah. To so so for 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 example, in this case, uh, in the top case, uh, uh, we looked at uh, where the um, coordinates of the points are restricted, um, whereas in the bottom case, we we didn't. So yeah. So here, I think it's. If, if you're given a quadratic number of points, uh, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, more a remark about your short title. Yes. We're wondering, right? Yes. Well, there is a paper that has a shorter or equally short title depending on what you count. Uh, and the, actually, the author of the papers in this room, co-author, that's you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You have a paper that uh, has the presentation title Delta bigger than pi over 2. Ah, okay. Yes. I care. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> in, in the labeled case, are the labels all different? I mean, if you have one... No, same. <laughs> so you have, you have two triangulations on the same set of vertices, but the vertices are labeled. Suppose you, you have only two kinds of labels, like uh, red, oh, like, red okay. edges and red blue and edges. Blue. Yeah. Is this yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Referring back to Franz's uh, question about the outer planar case, uh, there is an FPT algorithm mm -hmm. known. And the running time is, uh, I think, 4 to the k, with k is the shortest path mm -hmm. distance uh, for in, 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 this, in this flip graph. Okay. And it's, it's simply you build the flip graph and you do a uh, breadth first search. Okay, it's nice to see so many questions. Um, let's thank Jim.